All right, welcome to Chapter 4 ACC session. This is Professor Svark, and I'm going to walk you through selected topics in Chapter 4. Just as a reminder, you do need to read and take notes on all of Chapter 4. You are responsible for it, and you will have homework problems on most of the chapter. If you struggle with any of this content, make sure that you get help right away with either myself or in the Tutoring Center in F315. That's a walk-in tutoring center. Um, it's free to students to use. Um, you want to make sure that you are quizzing yourself on this material. The more that you can quiz yourself and, and use, uh, basically use a recall method, the better you're going to learn this material and the easier it's going to be for you to learn this chapter and future chapters. This chapter, chapter four, is all about inventory, um, purchasing transactions, sale of transactions, inventory shrinkage, and closing entries, including inventory accounts. So first off, I just want to talk about the cost of inventory. Whenever you're thinking about the cost of inventory, just think of everything that it takes to get inventory to you and ready for use. So that would include transportation in, would go right to the inventory account, tax, insurance, or any refurbishing, getting it ready for use would all be included in the cost of inventory. Shipping terms, I just want to go over quickly. Whenever I talk about shipping terms, I just draw a little diagram. So I take from the seller to the buyer, draw a little arrow, from the shipping point is where it, the inventory leaves the dock and goes to the buyer the destination. In fact, I always even just draw a little truck to give myself a visual. And then I look at the terms. There's two different types of shipping terms, FOB shipping point or FOB destination. Now, if it's FOB shipping point, I just draw a line at the shipping point. That indicates that basically the buyer owns this asset, the inventory, and pays the shipping cost the minute it leaves the dock. So it would go on to their balance sheet. They would pay shipping costs. They would be responsible if the truck got in an accident to replace the inventory, so on and so forth. The opposite of this is FOB destination. Okay, so same diagram. We're just going to change the terms here. It's FOB destination. Draw the line at the destination. Here we would have the opposite. The seller owns the inventory and pays shipping costs and is responsible for it while it's in transit, has it on the balance sheet until it reaches the destination. At the point it reaches this destination, that's when the inventory trades hands. There's also discount terms. So whether we're buying inventory or selling inventory, oftentimes companies to companies offer discount terms to encourage early payment. Here's an example payment term or payment or selling term. You always see a number, slash number, followed by N and another number. Okay, what this means is we are offering or we are being offered a 2% discount if paid within 10 days. Otherwise, the balance, the net, is still due within 30 days. Another example of this what might be 115 net end of, end of month or EOM. Same thing. The one represents the discount, so it's a 1% discount if paid within 15 days. Otherwise, the balance is due by the end of the month. Okay, and a company can create any type of terms that they want. So another example would be 310 net 45. Okay, 3% discount if paid within 10 days. Otherwise, the balance is due in full by the 45th day. Okay, again, you can create any types of terms you want. The idea being that we want to collect early payment reduce risk of non-payment, those types of things. All right, so we're going to talk about four types of purchasing inventory transactions. Okay, the buy, paying for, paying for transportation, returns, and making final payment. Okay, so part one, if we purchase 20 units at $10 each with discount terms 210 net end of month, that means that our seller, our vendor, offered us a discount for early payment. Number one rule is we're going to ignore this until we actually make the payment. You can see whenever there's payment terms, that means that we bought it on account. So we bought 20 units of inventory at $10 each. Inventory is an asset, therefore if we buy it, it goes up. Our asset goes up, it's a debit to merchandise inventory for $200. The other side of that, I told you, anytime you see these terms, it means it's on account. We know that if we have to pay it in the future, it's accounts payable. So accounts payable goes up, that's our credit. That would be our initial journal entry for buying inventory. If we have to pay shipping charges, okay, 
So let's say we pay shipping charges of $30. A couple of things that you should remember. Shipping in, remember, goes to the inventory account. So whenever you're thinking of shipping, if it's in, it goes to inventory. So there's our debit. We're going to increase the cost of our inventory. And when we're doing journal entries, try not to think about units. Okay, we're going to focus on units in chapter five. This chapter, we're just tracking how much does the overall inventory cost. Okay, our inventory costs are two hundred and thirty dollars so far. Okay, the other thing to remember is for this class, assume shipping is always paid to a third-party freight company, and we're always paying cash. Okay, so therefore cash is going down. We're crediting cash for thirty dollars. All right, third transaction is what if we return five units? If we return, we want to go ahead and reverse that original entry. So if we know that when we purchase inventory, it's a debit to merchandise inventory and a credit to accounts payable, well, if we're going to return inventory, it's going to be a debit to accounts payable and a credit to merchandise inventory. Not for all $200 worth, but five units at $10 each. Okay, so a debit to accounts payable reduces the amount we owe Credit to merchandise inventory reduces how much inventory we've paid for. Now, just a side note, if instead let's say that we got some inventory and it wasn't to our specifications, maybe it's the wrong color, and we called our vendor up and said, you know what, you sent us yellow items, not red. We ordered red, you sent yellow. We'll keep them, but you have to discount them. Let's say that they said, sure, we'll give you a discount of $50 it would be the same journal entry because remember that this credit doesn't necessarily mean units it means that we paid fifty dollars less so a return or a discount um, not not necessarily a discount but a return or if they gave us a voucher a credit it would work the same way all right finally if we pay within the discount period this is where we need to pay attention to these discount terms two percent if we pay within ten days otherwise the balance is due at the end of the month First thing we need to figure out is how much is in accounts payable. We started out with $200. We shipped back and got a credit for $50. We have a total balance in accounts payable of $150. How much is the discount? We take our total amount due, $150 times 2%, we get a discount of $3. Okay, notice shipping is not included in here. Shipping was to a third party. Even though it increased our merchandise inventory costs, it's not part of this discount. Okay, the discount is between us and just the one vendor, not the shipper. All right, so I'm going to close out accounts payable. Debit to accounts payable for the 150, the amount owed. Then I'm going to credit cash, but I'm not crediting cash for 150. I'm crediting it for 150 less the discount of $3. Okay, and you notice my journal entry does not balance. 150 and 47 do not equal. So I need a $3 credit. That's going to go to merchandise inventory. What this says here is that I did not pay $150 for my inventory. I paid $147. Okay, I'm going to credit. I didn't pay that $3 discount. So I'm reducing the cost of inventory. My inventory, if you looked at my T account, my inventory would have $200 plus $30 minus $50 minus $3. Okay, so we would actually be looking at 167 I believe. No, 147 plus 30, 177. Okay, so now you have a printout. You may want to pause the video here and try to work this out on your own. Okay, let's go ahead and go through these four transactions. If we, April 2nd, we purchase inventory from Lion Company under the following terms. $1,000 price, invoice dated April 2nd, credit terms of 215 net 60 and FOB shipping point. Okay, number one, ignore the credit terms because we don't know if we're going to pay it early. So right now we need to focus on the price. We're going to increase our inventory for 1000 and increase accounts payable for 1000 Okay, on April 3rd, we paid $300 for shipping charges. Remember that this is always cash and to a third party. Shipping charges go, if we're recording transportation in, it goes to inventory. So debit merchandise inventory, credit cash. Number uh, April 4th, we're going to return unacceptable merchandise that had an invoice price of 400 OK, 
Okay, remember to always just go back up to that original one. If we debited merchandise inventory and credited accounts payable, we're gonna do the opposite. We're gonna debit accounts payable and credit merchandise inventory. Okay, and then finally, we're gonna send a check to Lions Company for the April 2nd purchase net of the discount and return merchandise. Okay, we had a $1,000 start in accounts payable less a $400 return. So that means accounts payable should be debited or closed for $600. Okay, how much is the discount? $600, our balance in accounts payable, times 2% means that we get a $12 discount. This does not include shipping, so exclude the shipping transaction here. Okay, so we're going to get pay cash, credit to cash for $600 less the discount. Now we're off by $12 our discount. Our discount goes to the merchandise inventory account, indicating that we paid $12 less for that inventory. If we wanted to figure out how much is in inventory, we would take $1,000 plus $300 minus the $400 return minus the $12. Okay, so our total inventory cost would be $588. No, that's wrong, $888. Okay. All right, that's purchases. Let's turn to sales. We're going to do these four similar transactions, a sale of inventory, payment for freight, return, and receive payment. Okay, if we sell 100 units for $25 each that cost $10 each and we give credit terms, this is for early payment, we'll allow 2% discount for early payment, otherwise the whole balance is due within 30 days. First thing I want you to do though is ignore these discount terms until we actually receive the cash. Realize that there's two different amounts here. The higher amounts are sale, selling price. Okay, that's how much we're charging our customers, but we also have this inventory cost, the cost that we paid for inventory. Okay, we're going to use both in our transaction. Okay. So the first thing we're going to do is debit accounts receivable. Our customer owes us 100 units times $25, the selling price. Okay, and we're going to record a credit to sales. This is a revenue account, 100 units times $25. So the first thing that you need to do is record the transaction, the sale, at the higher amount. Okay, this is our selling price. But we didn't get these inventory units for free. We had to buy them, right? We just saw that in earlier transactions, that these inventory items cost us money. Right now they are sitting in inventory, much like a supply sits in an asset account until it's used. Then it goes to an expense account. Inventory is the same way. It sits under our assets until it's been sold. Then it becomes an expense. This expense account is called cost of goods sold. Sometimes you're going to see it as COGS. Okay, It's an expense account. 100 units times $10 is our expense of this transaction. We're going to take it out of inventory. 100 units times 10 times $10 reduce our inventory. It's no longer in inventory. It's been sold. So first transaction here records a sale. Second transaction records um, it's a, an adjusting entry. Moves it from an, an asset account to an expense account. Okay, our profit, our gross profit from the sale would be $1,500. But we know we still have more expenses, things like wages and rent. Okay. If we pay for shipping, shipping out, um, well first off, assume for this class all shipping is paid to a third party in cash, okay, just like when we pay for shipping in. Cost of shipping out is just an expense, it's a cost of doing business, okay, so we would record it to the delivery expense and pay cash. Third transaction is to accept return of 10 units, remember how in purchasing we just reversed out the accounts, we're going to do the same thing. Instead of debiting accounts receivable, we're going to credit accounts receivable. Instead of crediting sales, we're going to debit a special sales account. Instead of debiting cost of goods sold, we're going to credit it. Instead of crediting merchandise inventory, we're going to debit it. Okay, so here we go. The special account that we're, sales account that we're going to debit is sales discount. No, ah, that's wrong. Sales returns and allowances. So sales returns and allowances. 10 times our selling price is 250. Credit to accounts receivable for 250. That's the first transaction. Then we have to reverse out merchandise inventory and cost of goods sold. OK, 
Okay, 10 units times $10 and 10 units times $10. Okay. Then when we finally accept payment within the discount period, okay, first off we have to figure out how much is in accounts receivable. How much does our customer owe us? $2,500 was the original amount. We ignore shipping. Shipping is not part of this. Minus our $250 return means that they owe us $2,250. How much is the discount? $2,250 times 2% 2 gives a discount of $50. Okay, so we're going to close out accounts receivable for the whole amount. Okay, then we're going to debit our cash. They didn't pay us the whole amount. They paid us the, the balance in accounts receivable, $2,250 less the $50 discount. Now here's a trick though. Instead of adjusting this amount to merchandise inventory, when we sell inventory, we record that discount to sales discount. Okay. So this is your worksheet. Again, you may want to pause and at least try these four transactions on your own. Now let's go through them together. May 11th, we sold $4,000 of merchandise with terms 310, net 90, FOB destination. The goods cost $3,000. Okay. The higher amount is our sale, the lower amount is our expense. We ignore the terms other than realizing that that means accounts receivable. We're going to debit accounts receivable for $4,000 in credit sales. That's to record the sale, the revenue. Then we're going to debit cost of goods sold and credit merchandise inventory, which is our adjusting entry to move our asset to an expense. May 12th, we paid shipping. Remember, third party cash. For a sale, we debit delivery expense and we credit cash. May 12th, we accept a return of $400 and restore them to inventory. The goods cost $300. Okay, we're going to go back up to that original entry and we're going to reverse these out. The only thing is we're going to debit instead of just sales, add on returns and allowances. Okay. Debit sales, returns and allowances, credit accounts receivable. Debit merchandise inventory, credit cost of goods sold. Just take that original entry and flip the accounts. Okay, $400 is the selling price. That goes to sales returns and allowances and credits accounts receivable. Cost of goods sold and merchandise inventory get reduced for the lesser amount, the cost. Okay, on May 20th, we're going to receive a check. First thing we need to do is figure out how much is in accounts receivable. What's the balance in accounts receivable? 4,000 less the return of 400, our balance is 3,600. We're going to close that out with a credit. We're going to accept cash, except we need to figure out what's the discount. 3,600 times 3%, 3 remember 3% 3 comes from up here, our discount is $108. So we're going to debit cash for 3,600 less the discount, $3,492. Now my debits and credits don't equal, so now I need a debit. Remember, that goes to a special account called sales discounts. Okay, and if you look here, sales are just more difficult. The original entry requires two entries. And then all three entries below went to special accounts, delivery expense, sales returns, sales discounts. Okay, so here's a comparison. When we purchase inventory, all the adjustments, shipping, returns, payment discounts, all these adjustments went directly to the inventory account. Versus sales, when we paid for shipping, it went to an expense. When we paid, I'm sorry, when we allowed for a return, it went to a sales return account. When we gave a discount, it went to a sales discount account. Okay, so these four transactions for both purchases and sales are, are journal entries that you need to know. Okay, so I highly recommend go ahead and create some flashcards and just quiz yourself. If you purchase inventory on account, what does that look like? A debit to inventory, credit to accounts payable. If you return, if you allow for a return of a sale, what does that look like? A debit to sales returns, credit to accounts receivable, debit to inventory, credit to cost of goods sold. The more you can get familiar with these four transactions for both a purchase and a sale, the easier this chapter is going to be and the easier that future chapters are going to be. Okay.
Oops. All right, closing entries. They're exactly the same entries you learn in Chapter 3. We close revenues to income summary. We close expenses to income summary. We close income summary to retain earnings. And we close dividends to retain earnings. So remember C red. C, we don't close C, common stock, we, but we do close red. Revenues, expenses, and dividends. We're just going to add some accounts in this chapter. Remember that sales is a new revenue account. And cost of goods sold is a new expense account. And then we also... We also have two contra sales accounts called sales returns and allowances and sales discounts. Okay, so sales would be our new revenue account. Revenues are always to the right or credits unless we're going to close them, then they become debits. Okay, so close sales to income summary. Close expenses, so that would be cost of goods sold, sales discount, sales returns, rent expense, okay, and any other expense accounts get close to income summary. Sales discounts and sales returns, those are contra sales accounts, but they get close since they're contra accounts. They don't have credit balances, they have debit balances. They've got the opposite of sales, uh, sales or revenue balance. They've got debit balances. So to close them out, we credit these accounts and debit income summary. Third, we close income summary to retain earnings. If we made a profit, we would debit income summary and credit retain earnings. If we were running at a loss, this entry would be flipped. And then we close dividends. Dividends are debit accounts. Unless we're closing them, then we credit dividends and debit retain earnings. Okay, these are the four closing entries. And then finally, we're going to talk about inventory shrinkage. If you have inventory shrinkage, it means that for whatever reason, whether it's an error or maybe um, somebody's stealing, if you've got some minor inventory shrinkage, which happens with many companies, you need to record that and what happens is you take a physical account of inventory and you come up with a dollar amount. Your inventory on hand is 35,900. If you look at your books, your books say you have inventory of 37,800. So you've got a difference here. 37,800 per the books, 35,900 in the actual physical count. So you've got an $1,800 variance. You need to make your books reflect the actual balance. Okay, the actual balance when you walk around and take a physical inventory. When it's a minor amount, which is in this class it will always be a minor amount, when it's a minor amount we just treat it like um, the second half of a sales account. A debit to cost of goods sold and a credit to merchandise inventory. Okay, so if you remember that second half of a sale, we debited cost of goods sold, we credited merchandise inventory, that's all this transaction is, inventory shrinkage. Now you have to realize that if we posted this, merchandise inventory then would be decreased down to 35.9, and actually cost of goods sold here would be increased to, what would that be, 106.8. Okay. So now if we prepare the necessary closing entries for this company, okay, remember that first thing we do is we close out sales. So debit sales for 160.200 credit income summary. Then we close our expense and contra sales accounts. So our sales discount, sales return and allowances, cost of goods sold, and all these expense accounts. Okay, I don't know my income summary balance until I close out all the other expense accounts. So here's sales returns and allowances, sales discounts, cost of goods sold, depreciation, salaries, supplies, and miscellaneous. And we add all these up you get 166,000. And actually this cost of goods sold should be 1068. So I'm off here just a little bit, but Okay, then we close the income summary account. If we look at this, our income summary has a debit balance of 166 and a credit balance of 16200. I need both sides to equal. Okay, so we need a credit here of 5800. Okay, so I'm going to credit income summary by 5,800, debit retain earnings. We had a loss here, so we're reducing retain earnings. Okay, and finally, we're going to close dividends. So we, dividends is usually a debit, not when we close it. When we close it, it's the opposite. So credit to dividends, debit to retain earnings. Okay, our post-closing trial balance then would basically look like this. We would have no expenses, no revenues. Okay, and then we would want to go ahead and replace retained earnings with a new balance. 
Okay, so we would have inventory, common stock, and retained earnings. All right. So that's it for chapter four. This was a very quick review of chapter four material. Make sure that you're reading it, doing interactive slides, everything you can to master chapter four and do lots of quiz, self-quizzing for yourself to make sure that you get these concepts down very well. If you have any questions, please feel free to email me, call me, stop into my office, or seek help with the tutoring center. All right, have a wonderful day.